Good evening and welcome. My name is Caro Sullivan, and I serve the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry as Assistant Director of Continuing Education. It's great to see all of you here for our first lecture of this semester. Thanks for being here. As part of the school's mission, we offer an array of enrichment opportunities to foster Christian faith and promote lifelong learning. We do this with on-campus presentations like this one, as well as online courses, videos, podcasts, and other resources for personal enrichment and professional development. We have several online courses starting over the next few weeks, including The Joy of the Gospel, which will explore a vision for an evangelizing church, and John and Holy Week and Easter, which, explores, which will explore the passion narrative in John and other themes from the liturgy from Holy Week throughout the Easter season. More info on these and other courses are available at the entrance with these flyers. Our spring calendar of lectures is also detailed in this brochure, uh, which is available at the entrance, along with other materials on our other offerings. We have a number of upcoming lectures, and I would like to briefly highlight a couple that are happening over the next few weeks in this same room. Next Thursday, February 27th, Boston College professor Dieter Roth will present on New Testament manuscripts and the earliest visual depiction of the crucified Christ. On Thursday, March 12th, STM's own Father Andre Brulette will present on pilgrimage, invitation, and challenge. And on Thursday, March 19th, Sister Eileen Schuler will present on reading the Bible and the lectionary, gift and challenge. More information on these and all of our upcoming opportunities are available at the entrance. We hope you can join us for a future event. Please be sure to check out our book table also at the entrance. The Boston College Bookstore is selling a few books that Father Simone recommended at a discount. Thanks to Father Simone for granting us permission to videotape tonight's presentation, including the question and answer portion. We are so grateful for the opportunity to extend the life of this lecture. Within about a month, you'll be able to find the video posted on our Encore Access archive at bc.edu slash Encore. Bookmarks with this web address are available at the entrance uh, to the room. So during this program, there will be opportunity for question and answer, and there are two points to keep in mind. First, before you ask a question, please wait for the microphone so the video can pick it up. And second, please know that if you do ask a question, it will likely be part of our final video and may have a very long life. So just be sure you're okay with that before you're asking a question. <laughs> now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight's presentation, Encounter and Transformation, the Sunday Gospels of Lent, Year A. We're honored to have our friend and colleague, Father Michael Simone, kick off our spring continuing education lecture series. Michael Simone is a Jesuit of the USA Midwest province. He's a native of Ohio. After undergraduate studies at John Carroll University in Cleveland, Ohio, he received the Master of Divinity degree in the Licentiate in Sacred Theology from Weston Jesuit School of Theology. He earned his PhD from Johns Hopkins University, where he studied Northwest Semitics and Aristology. He's a member of the scripture faculty here at the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry, which he has served since 2013. His research focuses on ritual and imagination in the religions of the ancient Near East. Last year, his revised dissertation, Your God is a Devouring Fire, Fire as a Motif of Divine Presence and Agency in the Hebrew Bible, was published in the prestigious Catholic Biblical Quarterly monograph series. Father Simone has had wide-ranging experiences in ministry, including service as a chaplain at the Perry Point Maryland Vet Veterans Center and at Boston Area Substance Abuse, Tre Abuse Treatment Facilities. He currently serves as a Sunday chaplain at the State Prison in Walpole, Massachusetts. The Dean of the School of the Theology and Ministry, Father Tom Stegman, who unfortunately could not bilocate and be here, appreciates the way he brings his pastoral experience and perspectives to bear on his teaching at STM. Please join me in welcoming a wonderful scholar, priest, teacher, and colleague, Father Michael Simone.
Nothing at BC is really designed for somebody my size. <laughs> it's all designed for Irish people who, although they are not tall, do tend to tower over me. So. <laughs> well, I'm delighted to be here tonight, and I am, I am delighted and grateful that so many people have joined us. Um, I'm delighted, grateful, and a little surprised, so welcome, and I'm, I'm uh, honored to be able to kick off the uh, Springtime Continuing Ed series. My goal tonight is, uh, is to stir the pot, really. This is not really going to be an academic treatment of the Gospels of Lent. Um, everything I'll say uh, is going to be based on rigorous sources and, and the product of my own scholarship and, and the product of, of a great deal of thought. But my goal tonight really is to show you, show us all really, the Gospels of Lent, maybe in a, from a new perspective. To give you a, oh, sure. Uh, to give you a new approach to the gospel readings, and and maybe to find in them a deeper awareness of what Jesus was and and what he represents today. So this particular year, the Sunday gospel readings come from Matthew and John for Lent, the Sunday gospel readings of Lent, and we're just going to look at those. For the sake of time, I didn't include Ash Wednesday, and I, I didn't include Palm Sunday. The Palm Sunday gospel is kind of its own thing. As you remember, it's quite long and, and comes out of the Passion narrative. So we'll just look at Sundays 1 through 5. The first two come from Matthew's gospel, and, and the remainder come from John. These two books have a lot in common. Both are written kind of late in the first century, maybe within 10 years of each other between say, in the years 90 and 100. Both are, are consciously written by Jews for Jews, by Jews to help other Jews come to understand who Jesus was, what he represented. It's easy to forget about that today. And I myself am indebted to Amy Jill Levine, who has given a number of talks in this very room, uh, to remind us that the New Testament is a Jewish work. Christ's early followers, the ones who produced the Gospels, the ones who produced the letters and the writings of the New Testament, they, they all understood themselves to be Jews. Indeed, the final split between Judaism and Christianity was not as clean or as complete as once thought. Although the presence of the followers of Christ caused conflict in many Jewish communities, at the time of the writing of these two particular Gospels, it's fair to state that the Christian tradition was still part of the Jewish world and that it depended on the questions and the insights that Jewish traditions produced. So essential, I think, at the beginning is we're going to be looking at these Gospels from, from what I believe to be a, a Jewish lens vis-a-vis -vis the end of the first century. So both Gospels center on an important question of Judaism. How does one live out God's commandments? So at this point, some background is going to be helpful. We often speak of the law of Moses or the law of Israel or Jewish law. But the word law is not a complete or even a helpful translation of, of the Hebrew word that underlies it. And that word is Torah. Torah means instruction. The commandments God, God gives are instructions on how to be a human being. In the mind of Israelites of every age, what, what Moses handed on to the people of God are like the ultimate set of cheat codes. Any of you play video games in here? Probably, probably not as many. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of video games have cheat codes. If, if you know these, these hidden codes, known only in the gaming community, you'll be able to access features in the video game, you'll be able to access levels of the video game that, that you wouldn't have otherwise. Ancient Israelites believed themselves to be in the possession of knowledge that amounted to the same thing. Other nations had to struggle to find out the right way to be humans. Whereas if you, were, if you were an Israelite living in the covenant and obeying the terms of the covenant, you had special insights given directly by God. I should probably take a minute 
to define the word Torah more concretely. We use the term in, in its concrete way, in an academic way, as a, a collective term for the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These books are far more than just law, far more than simple law codes. They also contain historical narratives. They contain genealogies and speeches. They contain origin tales, what we in academia call etiologies. They also contain just basic instructions for daily life. What we have to remember is all of that, in addition to the law codes, is part of this divine instruction. So it's, it's not just the thou shalt not, thou shalt not, that is the law. It's Rebecca and Isaac falling in love and the way they fought, fell in love and how that becomes a model in many cases for, for Israelite relationships, for Jewish relationships. Probably more of our Christian understanding of marital love comes from those kind of traditions than we even recognize or, or can document. All of the Torah, all, every part of the five books, that's all divine instruction. That's all what's on the mind of Jews in Jesus' day. More than that, Torah represents an encounter with the divine. So it's not just a set of instructions. God is somehow present in those instructions. Sometimes that divine presence is called wisdom. Sometimes it's called the word. Sometimes it's called spirit. It has all sorts of other names that are a little less common than those three, but those are the three that writers come back to again and again and again. In every case, performing the Torah in some way, living out the example or the commandment, was an encounter with the divine. It's something like how Catholics understand the sacraments, an encounter with grace, an encounter with divine presence. And I think our Jewish brothers and sisters today, especially among the Orthodox, might take a similar approach. When I go out to lunch with my friend, Professor Levinson, if you know Professor Levinson, you know that you never use his first name, even if you're quite close. So when I go out to lunch with Professor Levinson, um, I, I, we, we always go to a kosher restaurant, and I notice the care with which he observes certain customs at the table. And what's taken me a, a while to recognize is he finds in that the same kind of consolation I might find in saying the rosary or receiving the sacraments, or being at prayer. That, that even though in my mind, the things he's doing have no, no clear spiritual meaning for me, in his mind, these are encounters. And so I, I think it's important for us to center ourselves in that awareness that what's being sought in, in all of this living of the law, living of God's commandments, and this, this desire for, for, for righteousness is, is that kind of, same kind of grace that we would encounter living out our own faith. So these encounters have a, a transformative aspect to them. To give but two examples, we have Jacob's nighttime wrestling match with that mysterious being who maybe is an angel, maybe is God, at the fords of the Jabbok River. This changes Jacob's life permanently. He receives a new name, Israel, and, and he also has his hip dislocated. As a Jesuit spiritual director of mine once said when, when talking about the life of St. Ignatius, when you have an encounter with God, you get a new name and a limp. And it goes all the way back to Jacob. This is good because at the time I was recovering from surgery and I remember thinking, well, here I am. <laughs> Jacob has that encounter with that mysterious being and his life is forever changed. Likewise, Moses has an encounter with God on Sinai. Actually, a series of encounters with God on Sinai. And if you remember at the end of Moses 33, I'm sorry, Exodus 33, Moses' face shines. It shines so brightly that other Israelites are afraid to approach him, and they make him wear a veil over it. That's a reflection of God's own glory. It's the result of, of Moses' life being totally changed by his encounters with God. So, in Jesus' day, many believed that observance of the law would result in similar transformation for anyone who remained committed. 
Now, I, I want to be careful, and they had a nuanced approach to this. I don't think anyone thought that they were going to be glowing like Moses on the one hand. On the other hand, there was a type of spiritual transformation that was just as profound we see mentions of this, we see hints of this, or maybe, maybe the working out of the theological understanding in texts like Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Those with insight, insight shall shine brightly like the splendor of the firmament. And those who lead many to justice will shine like the stars forever. Or the book of wisdom, chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. Lines we often hear at Catholic funerals. This is one of the most ca uh, popular Catholic funeral readings is uh, Wisdom chapter 3. As gold in the furnace, God proved them. And as sacrificial offerings, he took them to himself. In the time of their judgment, they shall shine and dart about like sparks through stubble. So in the mind of these two Jewish authors, and by this time we can speak of Judaism, the, the beginnings of a rabbinic Judaism, like the one we have today. In the mind of these two Jewish authors, this transformation with Torah, this living out of God's commandments, causes some kind of like, maybe we'll say an interior glow, a spiritual glow. It's a transformation that has two elements. You're drawn into the divine plan. So just like Jacob and Moses, your life has changed in a new direction, a way of, of you take a pivotal role in the unfolding of salvation history. And two, you receive a share in divine life? I don't think that's too strong a phrase. Certainly what Christian theologians do with that in, in a later period is, is come to understand we're drawn into the inner life of the Trinity. Probably not what the writer of Daniel would have consciously thought of, but it's, it's the beginning of that theology, that somehow we participate in God's life when, when we have these encounters, these mediated encounters with God. So, one of the realities that people in Jesus' day had to face was the antiquity of the Torah. It was at least 400 years old by Jesus' time. So the, the version of those five books that I mentioned before that we have now in our Bibles dates to probably 400 B.C., some argument about 400, 500, but, but it, it's several centuries old by Jesus' day. Portions of it, however, are much, much older than that. The oldest probably extend back over a thousand years to the founding of Israel itself. So in Jesus' day, this text was already a text of high antiquity. The text described a world that no longer existed. And I think this is what's driving some of the sense of urgency that we see when we read the Gospels. So in 750 B.C., just, just to pick a date early on, Israel was agrarian. Israel was an independent kingdom. It was a small state among small states. I, I checked this morning. Um, ancient Israel, so the, the Israel of maybe not David, but maybe King Hezekiah, uh, probably was like twice the size of Rhode Island. And that includes both the northern and the southern kingdom, everything that there was. So it's a small state among small states. By Jesus' day, by contrast, Israel was urbanized. It was colonized. It was one conquered people among many in a large empire. And significantly, the population was scattered throughout that empire. There was a, a cluster of Israelites, of Jews, living in what was the traditional homeland. But probably a majority of Jews, as today, lived outside of the land of Israel. As somebody who studied archaeology, I feel like I need to nuance the word urbanized, so just bear with me. This might be boring, but I find it compelling. So I'm not saying that people are living in cities, although there are many, many cities in Israel in Jesus' day. People are probably mostly living on the land, but if you had lived in Israel in 750 B.C., you would have grown your own food, you would have spun your own clothes, you would have been a subsistence farmer, there might have been a small surplus that you would have traded with your neighbors or given to a king who himself would have been a pretty local entity, right? We're talking about Rhode Island. In Jesus' day, it would have been very different. You would have been a farmer, but you would have been living on somebody else's estate. You would have been a sharecropper, probably. The land, the seed, even your tools would have been owned by somebody else. And the food you would have grown was at the service of people living in cities. 
So the economic activity of Jesus' day was all geared towards cities. So when I say urbanized, yeah, now that I've said it out loud, that was a completely useless piece of information, and we're going to move on. All right. So this is, this is what's driving this sense, this need for new interpretation, because the, the world the Torah describes no longer exists. And now we have all these new problems and new questions and new realities that the ancient laws don't really explain. So who can tell us what God wants? And who can tell us how to approach the Lord for this transformation that the scriptures promise? So the major duty falls to people who were called the teachers of Israel. Today we call them rabbis, but the teachers of Israel. And in Jesus' day, this was, this was not a, a heavily institutionalized position. If you had learned Torah, and, and any Jewish man could attend a synagogue uh, regularly and eventually, you would probably memorize major portions of the Pentateuch. In the ancient world, people's memories were much stronger than ours. Um, and you would find commentaries on them. You would discuss commentaries on them. This was, you would socialize over the Bible, essentially. These teachers of Israel, of whom Jesus was one, it fell to them to take this ancient wit wisdom and apply it to everyday life. Needless to say, this leads to lots of conflicting interpretation. So much so that by Jesus' day, there are starting to be multiple Judaisms all existing in the land of Israel, all sharing the same worship space in the temple. I once had a, a, a Jewish scholar in, in, a, in a course I took describe it to me in this way. Imagine if in Christianity, if the Reformation happened, but you all kept using the same church buildings at the same time. That was probably something like the state of Judaism at Jesus' day. So... Everyone agreed that these five books of Moses were, were of vital importance. Everyone agreed that the temple in Jerusalem was a place of vital importance, but bringing them together was a matter of ongoing discussion and controversy. During normal times, this would not have necessarily been a problem. In fact, Certainly, medieval rabbinic tradition, which descends from this world, kind of rejoices in diversity, right? There's, there's a, my favorite insight on medieval Jewish law. In a capital case, it, when 30 judges, 30 judges sit on a capital case, if all 30 agree that the, the accused is innocent, the accused goes free. If all 30 agree that the accused was guilty, it's considered a mistrial, because if 30 people agree, something's gone wrong. <laughs> so, so for those of us who appreciate consensus, that seems like counterintuitive. But, but if 30 people agree, it means that the defense didn't make a good case, or somebody was bribed, or something went wrong. And, and so in normal times, this diversity of opinion, this diversity of interpretation was not a problem. Jesus, however, lived in a time of stress. The, the Roman world was still consolidating during Jesus' life. The Roman Empire was still a relatively new phenomenon. And one of those aspects of consolidation was cultural corrosion. The Romans never stamped out anyone's culture, but what they would do is make it very attractive to stop being a member of your traditional community and start to adopt Greco-Roman habits. And so this, this generates conflict, obviously. Both Matthew and John, then, are presenting Jesus as somebody who lives in this time of stress, presenting Jesus as somebody who, who has a, the authoritative interpretation of Torah. He is the rabbi. And, and you hold up the interpretations of any other rabbi to Jesus, and, and that's, that's how you judge them. So let's start with Matthew, then. just to give a thumbnail sketch. In Matthew's mind, Jesus is the divine son, and he repeats that both in the baptismal narrative and also in the transfiguration narrative. Jesus is the son of God. So this is an important point. I mean, we, we take these things as Christological statements, and, and they, they mean a great deal to us in our own context, but, but to, to somebody seeking the authoritative rabbi in the first century, as Matthew's audience would have, that's... That's a clincher, because this is somebody who knows the mind of God, and it's the mind of God that guides our understanding of, of Torah. 
Jesus' teaching then represents everything the Father wants us to know. Jesus' teaching represents that definitive interpretation. And here's where, where Matthew's theology becomes, is, is very Jewish, is very much rooted in Daniel and wisdom. Living according to Jesus' word and example makes us like Jesus, makes us beloved divine children. There is that, that comes up at the end of the gospel. If you see, um, oh, shoot, I'm trying to find it, uh, no. So, Matthew 25, whatever you do for the least ones, you do for me. Human beings can become Jesus on earth in that sense. There is, there is a way of, to use, to use the language of Assyriology, divine overlap can happen. That, that Jesus' continuing presence and agency, even outside of his body, remains long in, in the poor in Matthew 25, but also in his disciples in Matthew 28. John's gospel, meanwhile, makes, makes a similar case, but does it with different kind of language. So Jesus is the divine son, and this is John 1.18. No one has ever seen God. The only son, God, who is at the Father's side, has revealed him. So in John's mind, the, the case is even stronger. It's not just that Jesus is the divine son. It's that God and Jesus, the Father and Jesus, have had some kind of conference before, before the, the word became incarnate. And the Father has given Jesus a very specific message to share. And that message is, is what's recorded in John's gospel. And only Jesus knows what the Father knows, because only Jesus is the Son. So, so in John's mind, there's, there is a, a level of exclusion that, that Jesus is, and so we hear this in John's language, right? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to come to the Father is through Jesus, in John's mind, because there is no other Son. Important, a point that John makes again and again and again, both in the Bread of Life discourse and in the Last Supper discourse, Jesus taught us everything that he learned from the Father. So there's, there's no hidden knowledge. There's no, I'm probably saying something that's a little, uh, arch, uh, what do we call it? anachronistic, but there's no Gnosticism in John's gospel. There's no, there's no hidden gospel. There's everything Jesus had to tell us, Jesus has told us. And, and the everything is the command to love, love one another as I have loved you, and the example of the washing of the feet. Now, I find that significant because it, it takes Matthew quite a bit of language to reveal everything Jesus wants to say. John is much more elegant in his depiction of the gospel. It's the one command, and it's the washing of the feet. So let's go on then to the first of our Lenten Gospels. And we're at 6 o'clock, so we're halfway through the, the talk. Anyway, it's perfect. Um, the first Lenten Gospel is the temptation. And it's the temptation from Matthew. I, I wish we had time to read these, but unfortunately we won't. Um, I, I hope you get a chance to read it when, when, well, I suspect we've all heard it before. So, so Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Uh, if you remember correctly, the, the Spirit is what drives Jesus out into the desert. And out in the desert, then Jesus fasts for 40 days and he was hungry, which is probably one of the purest things that the gospel has ever said, right? Um, Jesus is hungry after fasting for 40 days, and then the devil shows up. The devil shows up and tempts Jesus in three ways. Tempts him to turn stones into bread. Tempts him to throw himself off the parapet of the temple to show the wonder of the angels lifting him up. And then the devil, the, well, Satan specifically tempts Jesus to bow down before him, Satan, and worship him in order to receive authority over the kingdoms of the earth. What I find fascinating about Matthew's arrangement of these temptations, which is different than they are in Luke, by the way, Matthew arranges them in ways that play exactly on the three gifts given to the Son of Man in Daniel 7.14. So if you go to Daniel 7.14, the first gift is authority, the second gift is glory, and the third gift is the kingdom, or a kingdom. And if you look at the way Matthew arranges the temptations, they're, they're related. So the temptation to use your authority for yourself, 
Jesus can speak with God's voice is what Matthew is telling us. And so as God brought something out of nothing on the first days of creation, Jesus could turn stones to bread because he's hungry. But he doesn't. Jesus resists that. The temptation to glory, temptation to be carried around Jerusalem on the backs of angels, Jesus resists that as well. And interesting to me, the temptation to the kingdom It was widely understood in the first century that the kingdoms of the nations were somehow under the control of evil powers. Different Jewish texts worked that out in different ways, but that seemed to have been the the folk belief. And Matthew seems to be touching on that belief here, that, that somehow the kingdoms of the world were under the power of Satan. And that if Jesus really wanted the kingdom promised in Daniel 7, 14, he was gonna have to do business with Satan. Matthew is making a number of important points here. And and the most, so one, Jesus really has the things that we're waiting for. The marks of the Messiah that many of the Jews would have identified as as coming with the Messiah. These are things Jesus has. And, And He's going to use them in ways that were completely unexpected. That's the second thing Matthew is is trying to remind his audience. Because Not everyone was waiting for a spiritual Messiah. There were people waiting for a Messiah who was going to establish a real earthly kingdom that had spiritual attributes to it, but a real earthly kingdom. Jesus does not use any of these powers for himself. And Jesus does not follow the ways of the world in revealing his divine, or I'm sorry, his his messianic nature. The gifts are entirely at the service of the Father's mission. And so we can see then the way Matthew is developing this encounter and transformation in this particular text. The encounter is with the Spirit, not actually with Satan. It's the Spirit that drives Jesus out into the desert. Satan just happens to be waiting out there because in folk belief, the desert was the haunt of evil spirits. Birds, owls, actually, often represent evil spirits in the Old Testament. Anyone who's had me in class knows birds are bad, right? Um, Matthew has, I'm sorry, Mark's gospel, I think, has a fascinating little detail that, that wild animals came and waited upon him. Matthew changes that to angels came and waited upon him. But, but the fact that these wild beings out in the desert, which were often associated with evil, were now under the power of Jesus, is a sign that, that Jesus is doing something different. That, that the spirit driving him out into the desert was, was not to send him to the mercy of these wild and, and potentially evil beings, but rather to bring them to the, to bring them on board with God's mission. The transformation is what happens when one remains in the spirit then. So what Matthew is showing us is that in the midst of these temptations, these temptations that would have been very easy for someone who believes himself to be the son of man to give into, One stays in the spirit, one can resist the kind of counterfeit fulfillment of divine plan that these temptations represented. And so the lesson then, our our takeaway lesson from the temptation in the desert, the same grace is operative in us. Whatever gifts we think we might have, whatever, whatever skills the Lord has given us, whatever context the Lord has given us, these are things given us for mission. Like Jesus, we can't give in to counterfeit methods of fulfilling them, ways of using them just for our own pleasure or wealth or aggrandizement, but rather to seek out the divine mission and, follow, and use these gifts for that. So let's go to our second Sunday of Lent. The Transfiguration. This is one I like. This is one I like because I studied uh, for my dissertation. I did a lot of work on divine radiance and divine fire and storm imagery and clouds and stuff. So this is this is my world, which is funny because I remember when I was a kid thinking the Transfiguration is probably one of the most inscrutable gospels that we have. So Jesus takes his disciples. Oh, it's actually Peter, Andrew, James, and John, or sometimes just Peter, James, and John, up onto a high mountain traditionally associated with Mount Tabor in Galilee. In fact, if you go there today, there's a little shrine to the Transfiguration, but it's not really named. And he glows. So I I hope that 
that glowing is now resonating with you because, because that's the promise of somebody who lives righteously is that they will shine like stars. That's the promise of somebody who is sharing in the divine life, that they, they are radiant like the firmament. God's reflected glow off of Moses' face was a sign that Moses had had this life-changing encounter with God. So Jesus glows, except in Matthew's gospel, Jesus glows from within. Unlike Moses, it's not the reflection. It's Jesus is, is a sharer of divine glory. In the ancient Near East in general, this is an aside, God's glowed, right? That was a sign that you were a deity was that you could glow in the dark. Um, and this, I'm, I, I use that language, it's a little crass, but it's actually, if you read the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh starts to glow at one point in the middle of the night. Uh, but that's a different lecture. This is what's going on in the transfiguration, though. We see Jesus the way God sees Jesus. The apostles see Jesus through God's eyes. So, so Jesus is, the fullness of Jesus' nature had been hidden, or at least, at least not available to people who didn't have faith. But now, at least for the disciples who are with him, they get a, v- a view of Jesus through God's eyes. And there's a reaffirmation in Jesus' sonship. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. The listen to him is the important part of that statement. The Father's will is fulfilled in Jesus, and the Father's will will be fulfilled by anybody who who listens, which the, the broader sense of that is to hear and act. It's not just that you hear. It's that you have a transformative hearing. You hear and act. Living like him fulfills the Father's will in us. Follow the gospel, Christians, and, well, follow the gospel, Jews who seek Christ, and and you will glow the way Moses glowed. This is the promise that those first readers of Matthew's gospel would have heard, or at least the expectation that they would have heard, that Jesus has the same, he shares this, 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 divine quality that we've seen before, that in him it's refulgent, it's his own, it's something he shares with his father, and that it's available to any of us who follow his authentic interpretation of God's commandments. This is the background that Matthew is is putting in his uh, presentation of the transfiguration. So, again, we see Jesus as God sees him. That's the encounter. The transformation, I love Jesus' line, rise and do not be afraid. That's what will happen to the apostles, not immediately, but over time. Matthew doesn't give us a Pentecost account the way that Luke does. Matthew's gospel ends with the ascension. Um, but we know that that the gospel continues, and, and we know that the apostles go out and, and and our, their work is characterized by, by very free speech, right? The Greek word there is parasia, which is pretty in-your-face speech, boldness, holy boldness. That begins, at least in Matthew's mind, that transformation happens as part of the transfiguration. So the lesson then is if we listen to God, God will love in us what he loves in the Son. And this is, this is uh, from the seventh Eucharistic preface. It's one of my favorite Eucharistic prefaces in the Mass, that God will love in us what he loves in the Son. This is the promise of the transfiguration. And this is the context that, that the church is giving us for this, or that Matthew gives us for this, particular, for this particular reading. So now let's go on to our next slide. Now we go to John's Gospel. We have the Samaritan woman, also known as the woman at the well. She doesn't have a name. And in the West, we've never given her a name. But in the Eastern Church, she has, she has names. So the Greeks call her St. Photine, or Photini probably would be a... I, uh, I had a neighbor when I was a child. They were Greek immigrants, and the, the mother's name was Photini. I didn't call her that, but my dad did. Um, and in, in Russian, I think she's called St. Svetlana. In either case, it means bearer of light. And this is her role in, in the Samaritan woman, the story of the Samaritan woman. The primary symbol that John uses, though, is water. That's the, and, and we know the story. She's going to the well. 
to get water for her household. Jesus is there and he's thirsty. He asks her for a drink and the narrative unfolds from there. So John spends a lot of time trying to name or at least trying to describe the thing that he thinks is different about Jesus's synthesis of Torah. It has an effect. It has a power to it. It, it, it somehow changes people who live it out. And John spends his entire gospel giving different language and different images to that. In this particular image, he, or in this particular narrative, he calls it water. He compares it to water. Just as water has life-giving and restorative properties and life-sustaining properties, so whatever Jesus is doing has properties that sustain us, even through death, onto eternal life. And, and John plays around with this image quite a bit. So Jesus' words are the truth from God. Jesus' words are those cheat codes that I was telling, that I mentioned before. If you're a video gamer, you know what that means. Um, it's Jesus' words are life. If we hear and, and act, we will find the same kind of life that Jesus found, the life that, that transcends even death. This is the promise that John is making in the, in the story of the Samaritan woman and in other major, the, 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 sorry, the signs of John's gospel. So pay attention in, in, in each of the lines or in each of the, the little discourses of the, the, the narrative, the way that Jesus' words, the way that Jesus' message is foregrounded, is framed as the transformative moment. I know that the Messiah is coming, the one called the anointed. When he comes, he will tell us everything. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking with you. Jesus' word is everything. I want to pause here and just just say something about knowledge in, in the ancient world. I think today when we think about knowledge, we think about an encyclopedia or we think about Wikipedia or we think about Google, that, that somehow knowledge is, is something that it's a mass of data. It's a mass of information. Um, and, and that's, you know, and this is our pursuit of knowledge is often the pursuit of more information. In the ancient world, although that was understood and respected, there was a different aspect to it that I think is at work in John's gospel. And that is knowledge had a starting point. That, that all things at one point had come together, were one. We see this m- much more clearly in Greek philosophy, right? So if you remember studying the pre-Socratics, Thales says all things are water. I think it was Heraclitus says that all things were fire. Um, Parmenides just, just has the, the original point, the one, the one, I think he called it. Uh, later, Greek philosophers will have different ways of, of talking about that, that initial point of unity. I'm fairly certain that, that in the first century, Jews would have thought something like that about knowledge, that, that there was one insight that would give you the key to everything else, and that divine wisdom was the path to this insight. Following divine wisdom, living out Torah, Torah coming to understand the mind of God would lead you to this one insight. In John's gospel, that one insight is the word love. So... I remember Stanley Merrow was a professor here. Did any of you know Stanley? I see some smiles in the audience. Many people knew Stanley. Stanley used to say outrageous things. Um, he once told me in class, well, yes and no. What you said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Similar to that, Michael, that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. It's completely wrong, but it's brilliant. It's a sign you have a brain and you are using it. Was, Thank you, Stanley. Thank you. Stanley, Stanley was a big believer that, that, that John was after that unified knowledge, and that unified knowledge was one. And, and John, um, Stanley would say, in John's mind, the only thing the Father told Jesus was the word love. That that's, Jesus, that's God's only self-description. That's God's only dream for humanity. That's God's only commandment. And so we're not looking for a massive verbiage when, when we're looking for... He will tell us everything. What John is going to show us is that one key insight that allows us to understand everything else, the, the key that fits into any lock. And so that's, that's what's being discussed in this particular narrative. 
So if we just take a step back and, and look at what we can get out of the Samaritan woman, we all encounter Christ in our thirst. She was at the well because she had to get water for her household. And, and likewise, we come to Christ with, with the things we need, with our thirst, with, with the dissatisfaction we might find from, from the everything that we receive elsewhere. In John's mind, faith is essential. When we put our faith in the everything that Jesus teaches us, only then is our, is our thirst slaked. And so that's the word and example that sustain us is, is that, that one thing that Jesus has to say, that one word, love, at least in John's mind, is the water. So to live that way, to believe that, first of all, but to live that way, to act that way to each other. That's the, the, the thirst, I'm sorry, that's the water that satisfies our thirst. And that's also the water that's going to sustain our life even past death. And that's part of John's narrative is the way that works out for Jesus. So taking a step back liturgically, notice now with the third week of Lent, we're starting to approach the crucifixion. We're starting in the Gospels to hear a little about death and overcoming death, death and resurrection. It's really only at that point that, that we're starting to focus on the, the world of Holy Week. The next Gospel reading, we have that a lot more. This is the story of the man born blind. We have to do the works of the one who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So now we're moving away from water and we're moving back toward sight. Moving back toward light. This is another way, another symbol John gives to that thing that Jesus gives us. That, that change that comes over us when, when we encounter and believe in Jesus. We have light. It's the clear understanding of God's instruction. Because remember, John is a Jew, and he's writing for Jews. Jews who are longing to understand how to apply Torah in everyday life. Jews who are, who are longing to, to have this encounter with God that can only come through divine wisdom. The light is Jesus' command. Coupled with that, and in fact almost a corollary of it, is, is the idea of sight. So the healing of a blind man. Belief in God's instruction through Jesus is what John is going for when he talks about sight. He uses the word sight in, in various forms of it multiple times in this particular gospel. In fact, he almost hammers it home like it's a refrain. Blindness, interestingly, in this particular gospel, takes on two different nuanced meanings. So it's lack of belief either way. But Jesus at one point says to the Pharisees, if you knew that you didn't know, you would be exempt from sin. But because you pretend that you know, and obviously don't, then you are in sin. It's, it's a fascinating insight, on John's part at least, that it's possible to be, to be ignorant and innocent, but it's not possible to think that you know something and, and have that be the cause of your blindness. It's a blindness that Jesus cannot overcome. Well, at least not the way he healed the blind man. So again, John is focused on this, this idea, this, this everything that Jesus has to teach us. That, it's the, that everything is the word he received from the Father. In this case, it's, it's light, insight, ways of living and loving in the world the way that God would have us live and love in the world. And the transformation is that once we start to see, we start to see a lot better. Like it, it, it happens very quickly in John's mind when we start to live the gospel that new opportunities to love, new opportunities to be Christ in the lives of others, new opportunities to sacrifice ourselves for the life of another start to present themselves, and we are, able to, we are able to approach them and do them. So the lesson, the takeaway lesson, if you want to know what to do, simply do what Jesus tells you. 
John's gospel, as, as complicated and dense as it might seem, is not rocket science. Just do what he tells you. It's really what it comes down to. The story of the man born blind by itself is, is, has a much more threatening character to it than the story of the woman at the well. Jesus is starting to arouse real controversy here. He heals the man born blind on the Sabbath. And the, the work that he has to do to heal the man technically violates the Sabbath. And I just want to say something about that because we'll probably hear these texts being preached on. We might be preaching on them ourselves. And there are some significant anti-Semitic landmines that we can step into. So this is my little excursus on the Pharisees. The Pharisees... I think, have a, a, a reputation that's undeserved. And I'm, I'm with Amy Jill Levine on this one and many others, too, E.P. Sanders as well. Um, there are a number of scholars who, if you look at Dan Harrington's commentary, which is available in the back of the room, he will detail this in a lot more, with a lot more erudition than I will. The Pharisees, like many of these first century Jews, were, were hoping to find ways to live Torah rigorously, but, but to do so as a way of encountering the divine, at the same time, they were living in a world where the Romans were trying to corrode their faith. And so their response to that was to double down, to live as, as a pious Jew ever more ostentatiously in some cases. And so, I mean, Jesus will mock them at a certain point and say, look, at you, you're widening your phylacteries and the dangling your tassels and like really showing off your Judaism. That in itself was not bad, but it was the pride that went along with it that Jesus was concerned about. But I have to confess, and I, I, I'm saying this on record now, if I lived in the first century, I might have, might have had a lot of sympathy for the Pharisees. And I might have thought that Jesus was politically naive, because one of the institutions the Romans wanted to corrode away was the Sabbath. We know from Roman playwrights that Jews were thought to be kind of lazy because they took a day off every seven days. Roman, Roman workers didn't do that. Roman workers had days off. And actually, if you count them up, they probably add up to about the same thing. But that Jews took days off with such regularity. Romans found that odd. And the Romans who owned the land and owned the means of production in ancient Israel probably were a little miffed that once out of every seven days, they weren't getting any labor out of their Jewish laborers. And Jews would push back with, with ever more detailed regulations about living the Sabbath. And, and this, was, this was not inconsequential. The Sabbath at its inception was a sign of Israel's freedom. Israel lived the Sabbath because they were no longer slaves in Egypt. So when you have such a potent national symbol to begin with, you protect it. And that's what the Pharisees stood for. And so when Jesus comes by and starts, you know, compromising these protections of the Sabbath, at least in the mind of the Pharisees, I can see why that was threatening in ways that go beyond blind legalism, which they're often, uh, they're, the Pharisees are often accused of that. I can see why that, that would be something that would be existentially threatening to somebody who was very concerned about the future of Israel. I, I'm a con, commit, committed Christian and a Catholic priest, so obviously I see things from Jesus' perspective with even greater clarity. But I can understand the controversy. And so if we have the opportunity to preach or teach on the story of the man born blind, and, and when the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the leaders of the Jews get upset that Jesus committed, and I committed, Jesus performed this miracle on the Sabbath, it's important to keep in mind that context as well. Um, that, that the controversy Jesus is stirring up at this point is controversy that probably some good people would have differed on, even in the first century. Now, John has no patience for any of this, but John has the luxury of living after the Great War that is already brewing in Jesus' day, and John no longer has to worry about the politics of this. And so John can see with even greater clarity Jesus' insights on these kind of rules and regulations. So let's go, I think, to, oh, no, one more. Um, yes, the last Sunday of Lent. And we're coming close to the, an hour. Um, the raising of Lazarus. 
So if you read the whole gospel narrative, and I don't know that I don't know that I will when I preside that day. I don't know that your pastor will when he presides that day. Um, but if you read the full narrative, it begins with a conversation between Jesus and the apostles who are at a distance from Bethany and need to go back there. And the apostles tell them, I don't think you can go back there. Last time you were there, they tried to kill you. Because by this point, the controversy that Jesus has stirred up is, is really getting ugly. People had picked up stones at the end of the Bread of Life discourse to, to stone him. And Jesus puts himself in harm's way for the raising of Lazarus. I, I think that's a detail of the story that, that we shouldn't miss in our understanding of it. It's, it's not just a foreshadowing of the resurrection, although it is. It's an act of bravery on Jesus' part. It's, it's an act of, of self-sacrifice on Jesus' part and on the part of the apostles. St. Thomas, at one point in the narrative, and I never know if this is meant to be brave or kind of like sarcastically resigned, says, well, let's us go to die with him too. My, my initial thought was that it was sarcastic, but that's because I was a sarcastic child. Now that I'm getting older, I... I hear in Thomas's words uh, a certain level of, of, like, he's realizing now what his original yes meant, and he's willing to go along with it even then. So the line, John 11, 25 to 26, which is also a line we often hear at Catholic funerals, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even if they should die, will live and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. This is, in fact, how Jesus responds to, in some ways, to, to the threat of his own personal danger as he goes to visit Lazarus. Now, he's saying this specifically to Martha, but it's a result of the conversation he has with his disciples. Jesus has no fear of death because he understands that life is a gift from the Father and that his life is going to be taken away when the Father is ready to take it away and it will be restored when the Father is ready to have it restored. This is the, the third way that John is playing around with this idea of what is it that transforms Christians? What, what is this thing about encountering Christ that changes us? So the symbol here is life. But again, it's, it's life beyond any life that we have because it's clear death is not going to have dominion over it. Even those who lose their lives will receive them back if they are about the Father's business. That's essential to our understanding of, of what's going on in the raising of Lazarus. It's this act of courage on Jesus' part. It's a great miracle as well. It's a, it's a profound story. It's one of the more gripping stories of the entire New Testament. But there's an aspect of the self-sacrificial love that Jesus is teaching that, that colors even this particular narrative. So the encounter then is this great line, Lazarus, come out! John, I think, wants us to imagine the effect on our lives if we let Jesus say that to us. Because the transformation is untie him and let him go. There is probably, I, I, I'll speak for myself, letting Jesus say that to me untangles a lot it, when I believe, when I believe. I mean, I assent every day, but some days I believe much more strongly than others. So the lesson, Jesus' own act of courage has a transformative effect on me. And as I go forward, as somebody who bears his mission, we're called to the same acts of courage that have transformative effects on the people around us. We read this gospel in Lent not just as a foreshadowing of, of Easter, although it is. We read this gospel in Lent because during Lent we focus on the, the kind of asceticism, the kind of self-transformation, well, grace-led transformation that makes us more like Christ. And this is essential to it. So as we come to the end, then, take a step back and look at each of these gospel readings, or actually look at these gospel readings as a, as a five-week retreat, let's say. In each case, Jesus is embodying God's instructions 
on how to be a human being. In each case, the key was that when someone encountered that embodied divine wisdom, that embodied divine word, that they believed. In each case, that belief transformed the individual in ways that were far beyond the individual's understanding or imagination, and in ways that conferred a share of divine life, and in ways that initiate a new divine mission that transforms the lives of others. This is what the church holds up to us for Lent. So just so, as we journey through Lent and encounter the same Christ again and again through faith, we ourselves can be transformed just as the people in these narratives were. And if we let these encounters make us new, we too will come to know the same, the same Father, the same Father who will see and love in us what he sees and loves in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Five minutes over, my students would have walked. In fact, I think I saw one of them storm out. Actually. So we'll, we'll take a few minutes now, and, and I'm going to invite you to talk to somebody around you or, or maybe, maybe come up to a, a few people around you. Um, and and I, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on this particular question. What is the symbol that you give to the effect of that transformation. So John gives the symbol of water. John gives the symbol of life. Elsewhere, John gives the symbol of wind, of spirit. In your own life, what, what has symbolized that power of transformation that Jesus has? Maybe you have a ready answer. Maybe you've never thought of this before. But, but it, it'll help, I think, get us into the spirit of these readings to have a sense of what that is. So when we've encountered Christ, maybe on retreats, maybe at Mass, maybe in spiritual direction, maybe wherever. What's been the symbol? So why don't you take a few minutes, and uh, we'll maybe reconvene in five minutes, and I'll take some Q&A, or you can share your insights. All right, I think we'll come back together. And I will be happy to take questions, or there we go. I will be happy to take questions or hear what you have to say about, about whatever symbol you came up with. By the way, mine is food. The happiness I get, yes, obviously, it'll look at me too. The happiness I receive from a good meal in the North End is about as close to symbolizing the transformation I receive in Christ that I could possibly come up with. The idea that heaven is going to be an ongoing wedding feast, I am perfectly content with that. Yeah. Yeah. So... Anyways, uh, so um, when you have your hand up, please wait till one of our graduate assistants brings a microphone over before you start to talk. And there's a question in the back. Uh, my name is Joe Cabadas. I'm a veteran for peace. And this has been a great lecture. I really enjoy, enjoyed it. I learned a lot. And uh, I'm interested in the last temptation of Christ. The movie you're talking about? No, the oh, uh, oh, temptation oh, the of <laughs> Matthew. <laughs> Technically, we were not allowed to see that. <laughs> yes, okay, so the, the kingdoms, the kingdoms. The kingdoms, yeah. right. Ooh. So uh, my feeling about it is, is the fact that the United States of America is worshiping the devil. 19 years of war in Afghanistan, $5.7 trillion spent. Who knows how many lives? Lives, refugees. We have three popes condemning the war. We have Boston College, a Jesuit school, that are training students to go into this war, and nothing is said. I go to Catholic Mass and I say, peace be to you, the people next to me. I go out and protest the war. I've been out 18 years around the Boston, all around Boston giving out flyers. People walk by and don't want to even look at the sign. Mm -hmm. And I say to myself, this United States, live by the sword, die by the sword. And we have to start talking about this. Like in the 60s when I was uh, get, getting drafted, the, uh, I had priests tell me, go in. And I had priests tell me, don't go in. Mm. 
There was a split in the church, in the Berrigan brothers and all that. The church says nothing about this. And this is the, the problem I have. I think the, the third temptation that Christ had, he said, worship Christ. And what was John's book, Gospel? Love. Right. He doesn't say, bomb your, na- your enemies. Right? And that's what we're doing for 19 years. Thank you. Thank you. I, to speak to that, I, I'm on good ground. John Paul II said that war has ceased to be a solution to human problems. Um, and, and I can't think of a better way to put it. The, when when in, the, in the Eucharistic, I'm sorry, in the Easter liturgy, in the baptismal liturgy, when we talk about the glamour of evil, I think we're talking about not, not just the really garish attractiveness of certain types of evil, but the idea that evil seems to solve problems. It's alluring. It promises fast solutions. War is the prime example of that. So my, many of my friends who've served in the military will often point out, nothing we did solved the problem. What, what we can do is shift the problem to other arenas. What, what, milita- what the military can do is push the problem into the future at a time when maybe we have better skills to solve it. But I don't know any of my soldier friends or sailor friends or marine friends, I don't know anyone in the Air Force, um, who, who identify what they did as problem solving. And so, yes, I think that the kingdom that the Father gives the Son of Man in Daniel 7, 14, is not a kingdom the way that, that our own human agency would make it. Um, just as the glory and the power in that same, that same Daniel 7, 14 is not the ability to be carried around Jerusalem by angels, but rather the ability to die on a cross and still have people believe that you've spoken the truth. That's glory in, in Scripture, at least and in the Christian tradition. So I would, I would agree with you strongly. I would, I would agree with you that it's, it's easy. I, I don't know if I want to condemn the entire country, but the people who have been keeping the war in Afghanistan going are swept up in a, in a glamour of evil that eventually is going to reveal itself as vain, and, and I hope sooner rather than later. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, first, also very informative, enlightening. Uh, my question is a little bit more to do with how, I guess, John and Matthew, and to that, to some extent, the other gospel writers, how things got recorded, and and Ooh. and talk about scribal culture. Yeah, I yeah. Talk for hours about that. No, that's what I'm saying. So <laughs> if you, he uh, waved me off when I said that, it was like. <laughs> um, so. If you could speak a bit to, were any of the 12 uh, apostles literate? <laughs> um, and then how did their messages and stories get transmitted over those 30, 40, 50 years? And I assume Matthew and John were literate, and, or somebody, rec- you know, were their secretaries. Right. Um, You're answering the question for me. Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm getting at. Well, and particularly in just a writing format. Okay. So what I didn't realize before that you really emphasized is that John had a, seemed like he had a set of key themes that he wanted to touch on. Yes. And so did he take the stories that he'd heard about Christ's events and put them together Mm -hmm. and and leave some out? Mm Mm-hmm to get what he wanted to get across, as, anyway. So, um, thank you. this is probably be the last question we take, because I can talk about this for an hour. Uh, <laughs> in the ancient world in general, and I'm covering a lot of ground when I say that, in the ancient world in general, writing, the, the act of authorship was a collaborative enterprise. So, so I'll tell you what I mean by using the modern day example. Today, we think of artists as people who have special vision. Artists, writers, performers, they see, they hear, they, they can intuit things beyond what everyone else 
can intuit, and they can show us a world that we can't see for ourselves, right? So, so artistry in the modern world, and, and starting really with the Renaissance, is, is a solitary endeavor. And, and we place a high value on that. I mean, plagiarism is a major sin, and, and not just in academia. Like, if, if you're presenting somebody else's work as your own, that's bad. In the ancient world, there was, there was a different understanding of authorship. So the, the original, comp the, the person with the idea was usually illiterate because most people were illiterate. Writing was not a status symbol in the ancient world. Maybe by the time we get to Jesus, it's starting to become that. But it's, today it's a status symbol. If you, in the war United States at least, if you can't read or write, something went wrong. In the ancient world, they wouldn't have thought that. If, if, if Kings didn't read and write. Great prophets didn't read and write. We know Jeremiah had a secretary. His name is Baruch. It's recorded. We know that St. Paul dictated most of his letters because in a couple of places, I think it's at the end of Romans or Corinthians. I'm not a New Testament scholar. And all the ones that were here are now gone. Um, at the end of one of Paul's letters, he says, I am signing this in my own hand. You can tell because of the big letters, right? So he, is it Galatians? Thank you, thank you. So a scribe would have had fine motor skills and made, you know, beautiful letters, whereas Paul probably, you know, had maybe like second or third grade writing skills and would just take the brush and like write out his letter, Paulus, right? Um, so, so even St. Paul dictated most of his letters. So you'd have the, the author and then you'd have a scribe. And the scribe was more than just a recorder because the scribe was highly trained in literature of all sorts. And the scribes, we know, would often suggest motifs or suggest ways, artful ways of putting things. And, and authors would rely on scribes to kind of dress up the speech. Um, and so already, the act of putting something down on paper is a collaborative enterprise. Much of what we have in the Old Testament, at least, and, and I think a considerable part of the Gospels, is, is what I call conservation literature. So there were crises in various times, and people would just grab whatever sacred text they could and, and run off with them. And then later, there would be a process of kind of piecing those back together. The understanding was that these, these fit together at one time. Um, and so what we see in John's Gospel, and let's just focus on that, is that there are layers of editing, right? There are it seems like there are different minds at work, although all unified around similar themes. So we talk about the, the community, the Joannine community. So these are people that would have shared an understanding of the encounter of Christ, an understanding of what the transformation was like, an understanding of worship, an understanding of community life. They would have used similar vocabulary. Um, but you can kind of tell it's not always the exact same voice in John's Gospel. What we, so we usually will talk about the initial writing, which two people usually, maybe more, but an author and a, and a scribe. Um, there would have been a period of community appropriation, of community reception of the text. And then usually there's a final editor, somebody who, the, the text that we have in our Bible, that's the inspired text. And the, it's the final editor that hands on the inspired text. Um, and the final editor is the one who's taking all of this material, which, which might be like marginal notes in the gloss. It might be things that were corrected. It might be, it might be a full editions or, or something that a later community member said, you know, I remember the founder. And the founder said X, Y, and Z, and we forgot to write that down. So now I'm going to try to remember what he said and write it down. Um, John's Gospel has all of those kind of layers. If you read John Maloney's uh, commentary that's available in the back, you'll get a much better description of it than that. But what, what this means then, I think now, I'm speaking now as a man of faith. The Holy Spirit at every stage has the opportunity to influence, to modify, to, to speak through the, the hands at work, the minds at work. Um, and, and I think in dialogue is where, is where we get the spirit, the greatest. And at every stage, there's, conf there's communication, there's dialogue, there's discernment and sorting out. So that when we get to that final edition, there are layers of, you know, spirit-inspired writing that is going on. Does that make sense? Does that kind of reach what you're, what you're asking? Yeah. So, 
So I started that answer as a, as a scholar, and I ended it as a man of faith. Somewhere in there, in the middle, I made that transition. So there you go. Um, I, we do have time for one more. In the back. Is that Rick? Yeah. I don't have my glasses on. Hi, Rick. <laughs> you know, in two communities that we deal with a lot, university communities and communities of the incarcerated, there are two increasing trends, you know, mental health issues mm -hmm. and addictions. In preaching the next five weeks, what would be your main preaching points to those two communities and those increasing trends? What? <laughs> Well, all right, so I, I will, I'll be at uh, MCI. I, somebody reminded me not to call it MCI Walpole anymore. It's MCI Cedar Junction because um, the people of Walpole didn't want, yeah. Anyways, uh, if I'll go out to Cedar Junction a few times during Lent. Personal transformation is important to those guys. The guys who come to Mass on Sunday are there because they want their lives to change. Um, at least at Cedar Junction, very few of them are doing life bids. So these are all men who are looking forward to a day when they will get out, and they want to be different men when they get out. Focusing on the, the simple but profound ways that, that even the simplest fulfillment of one of the divine commands can tra transform an individual, for me, I think, is where I'm going to go with, with some of these readings. Um, so to put it simply there. And what was the mentally ill Jesuits? Was that the first part of this? <laughs> mental health issues in university communities. <laughs> Rick and I lived together for a while, so <laughs> I'll let you grab a catalog and figure out who I'm talking about. Um, I would... Uh, for university communities, I think because it's a, uni it's, it's a learning community, coming to understand that, that Jesus was providing a, a definitive interpretation and, and an interpretation of, of God's instructions on how to be human. I think that would be a good starting point, especially talking to young adults. Um, I, 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 it would obviously be nuanced and developed in all sorts of ways, but, but the understanding that what we have in the Gospels is not just, you know, arbitrary rules for being nice to each other, which after 12 years of Catholic catechesis, you can kind of you know, come away with that, right? I mean, it, it, it can get a little tiresome, but rather it, these, these, are, these are much deeper instructions on how to be a human being, and that I mean, speaking as a man of faith, I, I think they're cheat codes, right? I think this is, we're, we're learning something about ourselves through these texts that would be much more challenging to get a hold of without them. And I think that's what, what's what, we mean, what we mean when we talk about revealed truth. Um, so I would start there. Speaking specifically to mental health issues, I'm cautious of that. Because in my own experience of working with people who suffer from mental health issues, the promise of an easy fix is often very, very deadly. And, and so I don't have an answer for you there. I'd have to think about it. Maybe I'll email you. But yeah, I would not want to present these as if Jesus is here to provide an easy fix to mental health struggles. On the one hand. On the other hand, I just had this conversation with somebody recently. Um, reminding somebody who struggles, so in, in, in this case it was with, with significant addiction, that God's not going to give up. Just, just keep coming back. God's not going to give up. That was actually a transfor much more transformative moment than I thought it was going to be. Um, and I'm, I'm glad Jesus gave me the words to say it because it was, it was something that needed to be said. And I don't think it any, he had heard it recently. So maybe something along those lines as a starting point. I don't know. Is that helpful? Good. Okay. Um, one. Oh yeah. Sure. Sure. 
Oh, please, Yael. How could I not? She took every one of the courses I've offered at the STM. And, yes, yeah. and loved them. <laughs> um, when you were talking at the beginning um, about seeing Jesus as being in a Jewish environment, I thought that was beautifully transformative to just give an understanding for all of us who do ministry to understand that Judaism was not monolithic and it wasn't repressive. Right. But when you were talking about Jesus being told that's breaking the Sabbath law, right? it occurred to me that your image about the post-Reformation churches all being in one big room, and I would visualize the temple that way, that Jesus could also have formulated that answer in the form of saying, the halakha that I follow interprets Torah this way. And see it not as Judaism monolithic and I'll tell you the truth and you don't have it. Right. But the halakha that I happen to follow right. says that this is not breaking Sabbath law. So that was just a thought. No, thank you for that nuance. And I, I might, if, if I ever do a talk like this again, I think I'll incorporate that. It, there would have been in Jesus' day, with him or without him, multiple bodies of interpretation that, that a, a, a Jew could have followed and been a Jew in good standing. The nuance that I might leave, though, there was widespread agreement that, that whatever halacha you followed, you were following it under Roman oppression. And that if your body of interpretation was giving the Romans any kind of leeway to, to corrode Israel, something had gone wrong. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I, I, I would probably want to, I want to give that one more thought and, and maybe work something out. I, you, your insight is good, and that, that's going to change the way I think about this, but I, I think I still think there's probably widespread agreement. Even if we disagree in the particulars, the Romans are not somebody we want to allow to affect the, the development of our religious thought. Yeah, you're welcome. Please join me in thanking Father Simone for a wonderful lecture.